All right, what's up, everybody out there? It's been a while since we've been on YouTube Live. Uh, had some had some things going on. Had some internet problems. Had some Wi-Fi issues the last two weeks. Um, and then uh, after football, I uh, took a little bit of a break and then started weight training stuff. So uh, felt like it was felt like it was time to jump back on. Uh, see who's out there. See what was going on. Haven't talked football in a while with anybody on on live stuff. So also was interested to see how many, um, how many people out there might be, uh, actually playing right now. I know that, uh, we had some, the last time we talked, I know that there were some people that, um, didn't get a chance to play in the fall. And I know that when we do these, uh, when we do these live streams like this, I know that I reach people from all over the, uh, all over the place. So, just interested to see if anybody else was out there is, is playing right now, what it feels like to be playing, how much different it is. Is it really different other than weather? I know uh, some friends of mine up north um, are, are getting ready. They've been practicing and getting ready to play or just started playing. And I know uh, it's a little bit tougher in New York when you're trying to play in and practice in January, February, March um, when it gets really cold. So um, is that state of Washington now playing? It's good to see everybody out west getting uh, getting semi back to normal. March seventh, schools are scrambling to get turf time. Yep, I can only imagine Carmine what uh, uh, what that's like. But um, you know, hopefully, um, just a whole different aspect depending on the weather and what goes on and how much snow you get and having to clear fields off and just seems like it's one. Uh, you know, it just seems like it's one thing after the other. You finally get a chance to play, and uh, then when you get a chance to play during this time of year, uh, you got to worry about fields and clearing fields off and, and weather and whatnot. But uh, I would imagine, uh, as cold as it might be or whatever the weather may be, I would imagine everybody's just happy to be playing. I know when we uh, when we finally got the okay to go ahead and play, I know that we were just uh, excited to be playing and practicing and, and – uh, you know, out there doing some stuff. And it's interesting now to see everybody that's playing. Uh, you had all this time through the off season, you know, you had uh, all the zoom stuff is still going pretty strong. Um, you know, there's so many, so many different meetings and things going on and, and clinics and things going on. So now it's, it makes it, excuse me, kind of interesting. Oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, makes kind of interesting because now is normally off season and everybody's, uh, everybody's clinic in and getting ready for, you know, for us, it might be spring ball in May and then summer or next year or whatever. But it's interesting. There's so many people that are now uh, possibly playing football during, even though most of it is virtual right now, but um, you know, you're, you're playing football during a, a clinic session or a zoom session. So now I'm interested to see, you know, how many people are actually trying to take the ideas that they've been learning through all the virtual stuff and, you know, if your season's kicking off now, are you getting ready to play? Are you trying to use some of those ideas? Are you trying to, um, you know, are you trying to figure out what ideas you can take on offense and defense or special teams? Are you trying to I, – I would think most people, to be honest with you, the biggest thing right now if you're trying to play or you're getting ready to practice or play is probably, you know, trying to figure out how everybody else has done it, what, what limitations there are on you. You know, if, do you have different phases? Are you um, – are you allowed to be in locker rooms? You know, what are your practices like? I know for us, it was crazy going through, um, you know, different phases and different hoops that we had to jump through. By the time the season got near the end, it, it I guess you get used to everything kind of. Um, but uh, by the time the season got near the end, it seemed almost like it was normal. Um, you know, almost like there was outside of uh, some cleaning issues and some things like that. I felt like by the time the season got midway through towards the end when we were in the playoffs, I felt like everything was just about normal. Um, you know, but then, uh, you know, things, things change. And then, you know, you, you start to hear about, you know, uh, our numbers down, are they up? Where are they? But, uh, just interesting to see everybody now that that's getting ready to play. So good luck to all of you. If you are getting ready to play, if you're practicing right now, God bless you. Uh, anytime you're, Playing football, practicing football, I think it's a good thing. I think it's good for the kids. I think it's good for coaches. It's still amazing to me that there's so many schools across the country that are still virtual, that nobody's gone back. I talked to my buddy in Pennsylvania the other day, and, um, you know, he's got kids 
of his own. He's teaching and he's been at school four days a week, but he's got kids of his own in a different town that have been virtual schooled uh, or, you know, homeschooled through virtually uh, the entire year. And it's uh, just been crazy. You know, we've gone through both. We've gone from uh, we've gone from having less students on campus to getting more students back on campus. And now I think all the kids to me, at least the kids that I've talked to that were doing virtual stuff or at home stuff are just happy to be back on uh, back on campus and back to normal. So hopefully everybody, whether you're out west, up north, hopefully you're getting back to normal uh, playing your football. It's a little bit weird that you're playing it right now, but I think it's great. But uh, I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, really been interested in uh, we go to um, we go to spring ball in May, uh, the end of April, April 26th, we start spring ball. We're going to start uh, this Thursday doing some some seven on seven um, twice a week. We're going to start doing uh, with our kids that sign up in a in a third party seven on seven deal that that is sanctioned by the state, our high school only, our coaches. Um, yeah, it's crazy, David. The whole thing's crazy. Um we do a seven on seven through a state sanctioned league uh, and we do it for practice purposes, really, to be honest with you, we do it for techniques and drills and installs. And we don't do it to play a lot of seven on seven games. I'm not a big fan of, um, of seven on seven tournaments or seven on seven games. I like the idea of being able to do drills, the idea of being able to install stuff, the idea of, uh, getting to work with our kids. Cause we missed so much last year, um, having no spring ball and then no summer really, until the end and then scrambling at the end for installs and no kickoff classic right into the season. So I feel like we missed a lot. So I feel like we need to get back to get back to basics, get back to fundamentals. But what's kind of interesting is I've been since our season ended and I, and I've been looking at it the last year or so, but haven't really done much with it. But since our season ended, uh, I've been really looking into the three high safety structure. You know, we've been, for those of you that watch the stuff that I do on YouTube and follow the Play Fest stuff and follow what we do, um, we've been a three safety team for a long time now, but we're, we haven't been a three high safety team. So we've been a hybrid safety uh, outside linebacker type team where two of our guys are up and back players or down and back players, however you want to look at it, high and low players. Uh, and we play with a traditional free safety. So, you know, it's kind of that, that hybrid deal, positionless football. Um, and we've been doing it for pretty much probably eight going on 10 years now with our two safeties and our four, two, five, and then our three, three, five structure, but we've never done it from the three high deal. And if you're not familiar, you know, obviously I think everybody would know probably Iowa state is the most, is, is the most predominant right now, but a lot of people are starting to do more and more of it. But, uh, you know, basically it's a deal where you're playing with, uh, more three high safeties than you are um, three safeties in general. And what it lets you do is it lets you still play a lot of your split field principles uh, to to a lot of formations. And then you use that middle safety as kind of an extra linebacker. And he's a guy that's going to relate to number three. And if three's vertical, you get middle of the field closed because he's going to play three vertical. If three is anywhere else, he will then kind of relate in coverages as a linebacker, he's a big part of the run fits. Uh, it's got to be, it's got to be a dude um, that has to be able to run. He's got to be able to tackle. Um, I don't think he has to be able to think as much as originally when I uh, when I started looking at those coverages. I, I thought maybe it would be a guy that has to think or be a really smart football player, but I, I don't think he has to be as smart as I originally thought because he's going to relate to number three almost all the time. So as the formations come out, he's basically going to be a guy that relates to three. And uh, the interesting thing is, is looking at the run fits and, and when you're facing two back sets and split flow and, and zone concepts, uh, depending on where that sniffer is and who's number three, if that sniffer goes backside split zone, you know, he was three front side. He's now go, gone backside. Where are you going to fit that middle safety in the zone? Because I think how you're playing everything else um, obviously run fits are always going to be the most important. We talk about that all the time. And in every one of the videos we do, uh, when you're talking about coverage, especially in high school football, you would better figure out your run fits and how you're taking care of the run. Cause that's, what's going to get you in trouble, uh, the quickest in high school. Um, so 
you know, just trying to figure out where that third safety is going to fit. Do we want him on the front side? Do we want him on the back side? If we're playing zone read teams, is he going to be, you know, is he going to be a bonus player on the quarterback or are we fitting him front side and then placing uh, a linebacker or falling somebody else uh, behind to the quarterback? Been looking at it from three down and four down. Believe it or not, there's been some um, there's been some people that have experimented in with it in the four down world. Obviously, I think uh, you see it. Everything that you see it, you see it usually in the three down world. A lot of uh, a lot of tight front. Um, you know, a lot of uh, it's basically a theory where where you're presenting a lighter box and you're trying to take away interior gaps with. Uh, the five players that are in the box and you're trying to force everything to go wide so that you can still keep overhangs to two removed or trip sets. You still need to have your overhangs out there. And, um, you know, you're trying to kind of force the ball to go wide, no vertical seams, get it to go east and west, and then have that third safety kind of running around as an extra fitter. I think it's tough for them to figure out where he is in the fit on offense. Uh, I think it's tough for offenses to figure out when you get such a light box and you're trying to figure out point of attack who you're actually blocking um i think that that three high safety deal you know where that middle safety is is involved in a lot of the fits i think he's i think you're going to start seeing teams do a better job of it now because iowa state for the last two or three years has been playing and, and it's been played in the big 12 uh so much and clemson has actually done some of it i i think probably everybody has done a little bit of it but um i i think what you, you're going to start seeing offenses do a little bit better job um Understanding how to attack it and how to block it, uh, because I think, you know, teams are going to start figuring out when once they start to get film. And, and my deal is simple. Um, if, you know, I'm trying to figure out if it's going to be something that we base out of, excuse me, or if it's going to be a change up, because it, it's, you know, it, it never having done it before, I got to figure out how easy it is for our kids um, to figure it out. The great thing is when you first start out, you can start out teaching all your base split field concepts so I can get my safeties and my corners uh, to be able to play, you know, start with our quarters package and then go to our palms to read stuff and then go to our three by one adjustments. And we can do all of our techniques and our, and our fundamental work and we can work on our pedals and our shuffles and our breaks and our drives on the ball. And, you know, we can do all those things uh, the way we normally would. I don't think we have to really change anything uh, when we start our seven on seven work, I think the thing we have to do is figure out who that safety is going to be. And then I think in our seven on seven stuff, I think we've got to get him more inclined to start working in coverages as a linebacker first uh, and get those coverages out of the way to where he becomes a, a guy. Cause if you really think about it in old school quarters, if you were, you know, playing any trip sets or if you were playing two by two sets in, in quarters or two read, the middle linebacker, you know, the guy that relates to three is still a three vertical player. So for us, when we play, when if it's two by two open, 10 personnel, and we play palms or two read, our Mike linebacker has to run with a number three vertical. And, you know, in seven on seven and in the summer, you better get that taught because everybody in the world is going to run a kid right down the middle of the field because there's no traffic. Um, it's easy to do. When you're middle of the field open playing uh, split safety coverage, you're going to get a lot of teams that think they can get a running back down the middle of the field. So um, getting that kid to understand that he's really a Mike linebacker, he's got three vertical, but if three is out with width somewhere, now you got to get that kid to understand where he fits uh, in the underneath pattern matching parts of the coverage if you're going to play your same deals. Now there's other deals that you can uh, that you can play out of it, which lends itself so nicely to all the adjustments to where um, you know you can get it to where you play the three safeties. Um, now, when I say three high, I don't mean cover three. I mean three safeties that are staying pretty much on the third level. Uh, and then, to me, the middle safety becomes a guy that goes down. Uh, if three's not vertical, he goes down to be more of a second-level player. Um, but you've got three safeties that are on the roof a little bit more. Uh, the look seems to be a little bit more natural every down to where – you are uh, you are showing that same look, and then you're going to spin to your other coverages. Uh, how do I feel about a safety outside linebacker? What am I going to down line assignment? Yeah, I, I think you have to sometimes. Um, so, uh, so for us, sometimes when we were playing our three-three stack stuff, if if we got into some three-by-one situations where we had to kick 
our linebackers and we didn't feel like we could handle the B gap, we would make a call to that end and put him in a four I or, or you could make a call uh, to post snap, move him, however you want to do it. I think what you're seeing a lot of guys start to do now to handle that, David, is they're starting to allow if it's an if it's an open B gap defensive end, they're allowing that kid to two gap a little bit more um, to where any blocks that come out at him. Uh, any base or reach blocks, he can cross face and get into the B gap and make the ball go out wider to the linebacker. Uh, you're seeing, I've seen teams that call the stunt and and move him to the B gap. The outside linebacker just gives him a a bang call or you know a bandit call, something that that tells that end you know post snap you're going to take the B gap so I can stay walked out here to play the C gap. Um, we've moved him into a four I uh, from our from our odd stack package. We've moved him into a into a four I. Uh, instead of moving them post snap, um, and one of the things I've always looked at in, in with the four down stuff, it's interesting. I'll get into that and and what we're thinking about doing with that because that gets a little bit uh, a little bit interesting uh, with how you're trying to do it. But uh, it's not what you're talking about. But do you have any tips on getting into college coaching? Would love to talk about it sometime. Bob. Um, college coaching is tough, Elijah. Uh, it's a business about who you know. You got to have a connection. Um, I would say if you're trying to start getting into it, um, you know, you may have to, you may have to try and get on somewhere and see if you can be a film guy or a computer guy or an analytics guy or something, and then work your way onto the field. But, um, the, the sad part of coaching, you know, the great part of coaching is it is a fraternity, but the sad part of coaching that I never knew, I thought coaching was different than the business world. I thought coaching was all about, um, credentials and your ability to do a job and people would recognize your ability to do a job and you could then move forward from there. But um, I found out early on when I moved to Florida in 1998, one of the reasons I moved to Florida is I thought if I, uh, I was coaching small school, I played small school football in New York. And then I was a graduate assistant at the same place that I played. And one of the reasons I moved to Florida is because I thought if as big uh, as football was in Florida, I thought if I went down there and did a good job, people would recognize that. And I would get into the college coaching profession. Um, became a head coach my first uh, six months after moving down um, to Florida. And I've been a head coach for 22 years ever since. So uh, it gets harder and harder as you get older. Obviously, I have kids now and, and, um, and, and you know, I'm not willing to make any move. Uh, it's got to be the right, uh, the right deal. But, um, but the deal is you you have to hook on with somebody. If you watch the – like the interesting thing when you watch the offseason, watch all the college moves and the NFL moves that go on and 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 watch, um, you know, watch how many guys just get retreaded, you know, and watch how, you know, somebody takes a job at a place and people get fired and then the guy that they work for gets a job at a different place and then they go with him. And it, it's just, you know, there's a lot of retreads. I know a, a lot of people in the NFL get upset about it because there's a lot of great – coaches out there that aren't getting their just due. Uh, they're not getting enough chances. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a copycat deal. It's a retread deal. And, and, uh, you know, all you got to do is follow college football every off season and see who gets fired and then where they get hired and then who they bring in, who they, you know, retain on staff. Cause it's really at that level, it's really all about, um, it, um, it's all about, you know, hooking on hitching on onto a wagon and hoping that, that, you know, that wagon does real well. And the guys that have done it uh, have done, you know, obviously real well for themselves. When your guy that you hook onto uh, makes it big, you're always probably going to have a job as long as you can recruit. Um, but um, it's tough, Elijah. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really more about who, you know, to be honest with you. A uh, little gimmick when he sent in applications like a pair of shoes or gum. So people would remember him. I don't know if Coach Mack would recommend that, but it worked for Coach. Yeah, anything that – I mean, anything you do that gets somebody to remember you, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever – you know, if it's a gimmick like that, if it's something personalized, you know, coming in with, with a letter or something, whatever it may be, you know, it's it's about making yourself different if it's an application process. Obviously, you got to get in the door to interview. Um, you know, you got to try and get yourself in the door to interview. A lot of times those jobs are, are uh, not necessarily posted and then – uh, interviewed based on resumes. Uh, a lot of those jobs are interviewed based on who knows who. So um, interesting topic, though. Good question, Elijah. Uh, tough to do. Um, you know, tough to do, especially if you, you know, a lot of times the easiest way to get in it, uh, to be honest with you, is is if you were a player in college, then you 
uh, UGA first, and then you try and get on from there. And obviously the bigger program you played in, the bigger coach name that you played for, the better chance you got. Um, but uh, it's tough to do if you're not one of the people that are uh, part of that inner circle. So uh, Kyler Murray's warm-up guy in Arizona broke through by school. Inter yeah, uh, interns, any, anything you can do, to you got to get your foot in the door somehow. Um, you know, how, however you however you can do it, you got to get your, your foot in the door to get with somebody. And then once you get with somebody, I always tell, when people ask me about high school stuff, I tell them all the time, you, you've got to, uh, Pete, I've asked you a million times, did you go to CW Post? You got to answer the question. Uh, you know, you, you got to get your foot in the door. And then when you get your foot in the door, you do any job they give you. You break down film, you pick up dummies, you do anything you can to, to, to be around. And then they'll notice that you got... Uh, now that you, Pete, are you, uh, you don't have to give your age out, but I'm 48. Are you older than me? Okay. We have, we have a, a very unique, uh, real good close friend of both of ours, Chris camera. I knew that was you. I knew it I, when I saw the name and as soon as I found out you went to CW Post, I kind of figured that was you, but I didn't want to. Sorry, I'm off on a tangent, guys, but this guy is uh, is um, is a guy that played at CW Post in college. He's older than me, but my one of my best friends in the world, Chris Camera, lives on Long Island. I play in a member guest with him every year. Uh, great guy. And and he used to talk about Pete Porcelli all the time. So uh, sorry, guys, just a uh, little bit of a fanboy moment for me there. Uh, Chris used to talk about uh, Pete all the time. Funny, funny stuff. Pete, I hope you're not as crazy as you used to be because Chris had some really, really wild stories. Um, but Pete was a really good player too. Uh, really good player um, back in the day. Um, so, um, yeah, New York's having a mini season, Pete. I still talk to everybody up there. Uh, Joe Del Gaze, I'm pretty sure you know Joe Del Gaze. He might have been at post coaching when you were there. Uh, Frank Cimenti, a uh, real good friend of mine. Uh, who played at post. I played against Frank when he was at post. All of us are a little bit younger than you now. Uh, about six years younger than you and Chris or four years younger than Chris. I don't think Chris is 54 yet, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, all those guys are getting ready to play. So uh, Rob, Rob Blount, another CW post guy coaching at Oceanside. So I know all those guys real well and they're getting ready to play and it's going to be awesome. But uh, you know, you got to get your foot in the door. It's about who, you know, you got to get in. I got in at St. John's where I played, and then I just felt like it was a vicious circle now that we're kind of talking about that. All we had up north at the time in 96, 97, uh, CW Post was D3. St. John's was D3. Kings Point was D3. Stony Brook was D3. Hadn't made the move to 1AA yet. Uh, us and Stony Brook went 1AA non-scholarship, which was glorified D3. Hofstra went 1AA scholarship and then went completely out the window. So when it came time for me to get into the business, I felt like if I wanted to get out, I felt like Long Island was kind of a dead end. As much as I loved growing up there, I felt like it was a dead end. So uh, so I, I moved down to Florida and I thought that that's the way uh, that the world works. Um, but it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, it was more. A lot of my friends, uh, a lot of my friends were, Chris had coached me. Chris Cameron had coached, uh, obviously he coached O-line, but, but we uh, I played while Chris was coaching and then, uh, uh, yes, Pete, I think you can. Um, the only, the only thing I would tell you is that you probably need a change up of something that's too high. So you're not middle of the field, close single high all the time, but, uh, depending on your talent level and who you're playing, uh, yes, you can get away with playing cover three and man free. A lot of people do it and it's been good forever. Um, and then Chris got into the business world. His dad's a big time, um, big time marketing guy in, uh, in, in the city. And so Chris started work, working in the city and my other friends started working in the city. And I didn't like that whole life. I didn't like that. You had to be connected to somebody. I didn't like, it was all about who, you know, um, no problem, Pete. And, and then, uh, you know, I got into football and I found out it's the same thing. So, um, you know, it's a crazy business. Just if you want to get into college, uh, see if you can intern, see if you can be a film guy, see if, uh, yes, yeah, dad was way back in the day with the USFL back in the day when Pan Am was, was still, uh, was still an airline. Um, but if you, uh, you know, you, you break in that way, you be, if you're at a high school, you do an internship, you'd be a video guy, you break down huddle, you just do whatever you can. People will recognize your work ethic, be real, be authentic, be who you are. 
uh, work your ass off and, and good things will happen. So, you know, in, in talking about, um, in, in, in talking about, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember those days, Pete, it was pretty cool, pretty cool time seeing Dom with, uh, with Trump and the generals and right when, I guess, I think the generals took Herschel Walker or maybe, or I think, I'm not sure if I remember that much. I've been hitting the head a, a, a bunch of times. Um, but you know, when, when you think about Iowa state, you think about, uh, you think about three down, you think about tight front. Now they don't play tight front exclusively. You know, they'll play, uh, they'll play some Oki where they're, where they're kind of five, zero five. Uh, they'll play, they'll play tight with, you know, obviously with the zero and then, and then the two inside four eyes. Uh, but when, when people think three high, they think, uh, they think, um, they think odd front, you know, and they think light boxes. They think three, two boxes or three, one boxes. Cause that's how Iowa state does it. But the interesting thing is I'm thinking about doing it from four down and and I'll get into that. Um, I'm glad, kind of glad, glad I jumped on and did this tonight. This is a small world we live in. Um, 25 years in online coach in Idaho. How does one jump ship from freezing Idaho and move to a warmer state? Uh, he, if you got a teaching degree, you just gotta, you just gotta. Uh, if you got a wife or kids, whatever, you just gotta convince them. You gotta get up and go. People are always looking for teachers. They're always looking for coaches. Um, you know, they're 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 you know. People want good people. I'm looking for coaches all the time. I finally got a full staff. I got some young guys that I really like, but throughout my 22 years, my staff changes all the time. Guys get in, they get out. Guys get into coaching. They thought it was one thing. They get out because they don't like it. Guys get into education. They get out because there's no money. So, um, you know, if, if you're a teacher or you got a job that you can move, best thing is, Paul, you just get up and do it. I, I did it uh, in 1998. I moved from Long Island, uh, New York, down to Jacksonville, Florida, and I've been here ever since. I'm not moving again. So, um, you just take a chance, you do it and, and hopefully it works for you. But, uh, you know, weather's great. Golf is great. Um, summer suck a little bit when you're training and, and getting kids ready to play. And, and, you know, you play at, uh, seven o'clock on a Friday night and it's 96 degrees at kickoff. That gets a little bit rough, but, uh, you know, it's pretty good when you're still wearing short sleeves in November and, and you don't have a lot of rough weather games. So, uh, the warm weather is, is awesome. Um, so I recommend it, Paul. Uh, if you're into making a move, um, you know, the, the great thing now with social media is you can meet people before you ever move. The old days, you used to have to interview for jobs and and and, you know, know people physically. Now you can meet people online. There's always people on Twitter posting jobs and you can send them, you know, hey, DM, you know, you can DM me your, res your resume and and and, you know, send a resume and a direct message. And there's constantly jobs being posted on Twitter and, and everywhere else. So. I think that part of social media has been awesome. Obviously, uh, what I do on YouTube and Twitter has, has been awesome for me. There's a lot of bad things about social media, but I think it's been awesome for me as well. But um, so when we get back into three high stuff, right, and we're talking about it from four down. Um, yeah, 25 is pretty cold. <laughs> I don't care if you're used to being in Idaho or not. 25 degree weather is pretty damn cold. Um, so, you know, the idea is 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 you're lightening, you're lightening up the box, right? And you're trying to you're trying to take away interior gaps. You're trying to take away the B gaps, which are kind of the honey holes of of most spread teams uh, that want to run, whether they're a zone team or they're running power counter. They really want to hammer those B gaps. So you're trying to take those B gaps away, eliminate vertical seams. You're trying to get the ball to go east and west, right? Well, the weird thing when you think about four down fronts, right? Every time every time I do a video, every time we've played four two five stuff or over front. You know, you always think about a three and a five or a seven or a six or a nine, whatever you want to look at it on a tight end side. And you think about a one or a two I and a five on the backside, right? Well, in order to play three high stuff with four down, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take away interior gaps. So you're either going to have to move to it post snap or allow somebody to play two gap because what's really going to happen is you're going to play with a lot of five man boxes because in order for your, what well, for me, what would be my uh, my hybrid safety outside linebacker guys, they're now going to be high a lot of the time in coverage. They're going to be back on a hash mark more than they used to be in our standard split field coverages. So what that means is my linebackers now become the apex guys. So my Mike and my Will and my 425, they're the guys that are now going to be apexed out. They're the guys that are going to be walked out, you know, you're going to be playing a lot of five man boxes as odd as that sounds, even versus two back. Like if you think about twins open 
20 personnel or 11 personnel. You know, if you watch Iowa State play, they're going to play a five-man box, and and it's crazy, and I know people think it's crazy. Um, but within that five-man box, they take away all the interior gaps, and they get the ball to go east and west, and then that third safety is the guy that kind of fits. So I was looking at it. You know, the, the only thing that I'm stuck on right now, and, and now that Pete mentioned – uh, now that Pete mentioned, can you get away with playing uh, cover three and cover one? And, and you know, my uh, my suggestion was have some type of change up uh, where you can be too high, middle of the field open, just because everybody is going to game plan you middle of the field closed and they're going to game plan you for single high stuff. I think the same way with, with odd and even stuff. Now that I've been doing this for 22 years, I am fully convinced that if you're an even team, you need an odd package. If you're an odd team, you need an even package. So what I'm struggling with now, uh, AT, awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are you in Japan right now? If you're in Japan, that is awesome. Every time we do YouTube Live, it's somebody from um, – somebody comes on from another country. I'm doing a Zoom I'm doing a Zoom meeting with coaches from Brazil uh, sometime in the next week or so. It, it's abs- it's it's still to this day so humbling. It's amazing. I can't believe that when I walked out in front of a camera doing YouTube stuff that it would get to this. But um, it, it's still to me. It's just it's it's I kind of every time I see something like that, AT somebody that's from a foreign country or something else, I uh, right away I just think to myself, wow, it's amazing. Um, so if uh, you know, if we're going to be a four down team and and let's just look at it, you start off looking at it. Let's look at it from, you know, I don't know about you guys, uh, but I see a lot of two by two. I see a lot of 10 personnel, two by two, three by one. And then we see um, in, in uh, we see we see, you know, a little bit of 21 personnel here or there. Not much. Uh, we see a bunch of 11, obviously. But if you, you if you think about like 11 personnel, why off or you think about 20 personnel, uh, twins open, two back stuff, right? It's crazy to think that versus two back stuff with five linemen and a sniffer, fullback, whatever you want to call them, that you would play with a five man box. Um, and if you are going to play three high coverages, you have to uh, you have to convince yourself that you are going to play with light boxes, and you are strategically going to uh, do things to take interior gaps away to get the ball out where you want it. So when you think about, uh, you know, standard football spilling and and wrong arming and getting the ball to uh, go east and west with no vertical seams and your standard 4-2, 4-3, even in your odd package stuff, when you think about spilling the ball, you're getting it to go east and west. You're trying to get it to go to unblocked players. You know, you're trying to do so many things that, that you dictate as a defense where the football goes. And within the three high structure now, you're really going to do the same thing. You're just going to do it, um, you know, you're going to do it from some a little bit more unconventional ways. So when you think about the tight front, right? So when you get that tight front that's now become uh, the niche in football, uh, the flavor of the, of the month and um, a pain in the ass for offensive guys, uh, you think about those two four eyes, right? They're in the B gap. Your tackles, you know, depending on if you're running zone, are you going to read them? Can you cut them off with your tackle? If you can't cut them off with your tackle, what's the apex guy doing? Are they sending a fourth? Where's the fourth coming from? You know, all those things that that odd tight front kind of presents itself to. And the the, the one thing that the tight front struggles a little bit with, and if you if you study it enough or if you look at it enough, you'll you'll find the, the, the term mint front uh, that Georgia plays a lot of and Alabama plays a lot of it too. But the mint front is, is essentially tight with that Jack weak side rusher becoming a fourth rusher from the weak side. So they're presenting that tight front and sending a fourth rusher. Most of the teams that play the tight front, they drop eight a lot or they have a spy or a late add on. And you got to figure out who that fourth add on is because when you play interior techniques like that, they're not set to be uh, great pass rushers from that alignment. Not that they're not great pass rushers. They're just not set to be, productive pass rushers from a four eye inside eye alignment and teams will, um, you know, depending on who you study, you'll get different answers on how teams contain the quarterback, how teams uh, set the pocket. 
you know, does the four eye when he gets a pass set, does he ricochet back outside to be a contained player? When he gets a pass set, does he try to penetrate up the field so that the quarterback has to move up in the pocket? Do they let their four eyes rush wherever they want? I know what we did, and this is not um this is not four eye stuff, but when in our three three stack, we never included the mic in any of our base coverages because it allowed us to play our traditional four two five coverages, dropping seven, not eight. Um, we had some eight man cover drop coverages, but we took the mic and we made him a spy and a late add on. So it allowed our two defensive ends to win wherever they needed to win to get to the quarterback. We didn't tell them they had to be contained rushers because we told them that that um, that when they rush the passer, if they can win inside, go ahead and win inside. Then the mic had to be taught how to contain secondary if the quarterback left the pocket. That's how we play. So there'll be some teams that do that with their four eyes where, you know, their four eyes don't necessarily have to be outside rushers. They can be interior rushers. Um, and then the fourth guy can come late. He can come from the inside. He can come from the outside. He could be a spy. So when you play those inside techniques like that, you're really, um, you're, you're, you're shoring up the, the, the run game. You're, you're creating some havoc on, some double teams and some leverage and some angles. Um, so, you know, in doing those things, though, you're kind of limiting yourself in pass rush. And that's why, you know, to this day, you still see probably more bare uh, five-man stuff in the NFL when you when you get to double eagle, double three techniques or, or four eyes because those guys in the NFL, you know, you look at the Patriots winning the Super Bowl with Tom Brady. The NFL is still a quarterback-driven league. It is more so a quarterback-driven league now maybe than it's ever been. And, you know, uh, the NFL is a passing game. It used to be – you know, I, th I still think you got to stop the run. I still think you've got to um, – offenses you got to establish to run. But you do not need to run the football or be dominant running the football anymore to win in the NFL. And now it's almost getting to the point where college 100% do not tell me anymore that defense wins championships. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me the old adage of offense sells tickets, defense wins championships. Don't tell me that anymore because all the best teams are scoring 50, 60 points a game. And because they're scoring 50, 60 a game, they're giving up 40. Just look at Alabama and, and look at Nick Saban and how he's changed the way that Alabama plays football. He knows the deal. He knows where the game's gone. And that's what makes him – probably the best to ever do it at that level. He is not afraid to change and sacrifice, even though he's a defensive guy. He is not afraid to do the things that he knows uh, work and he knows win. So he'll win 50 to 30. He does not care. Um, so, you know, the, the guys in the NFL get worried. The tight front worries them because they can't generate a pass rush. So the mint front was a way to generate a pass rush, bring that fourth guy coming from the weak side edge, still have – you know, two interior, four eyes, but make a long story short, getting back to my original premise, I thought about it. You know, I originally thought about playing in the four down front. I actually thought about playing with a four eye and a two eye as opposed to a three and a five. I thought about playing with a four eye and a two eye, a two eye and a five on the backside. And I thought about letting the backside five be a two gap guy that can play the B gap on any blocks that come at him. So now that if I have a five man box, I've taken away the A and the B gap on the front side with the two I and the four I. I've got the A and the B gap taken away on the, on the back side. If they block out, my backer in a box becomes the B gap player. I'm sorry, if they block out and my weak end two gaps through the B gap, then my backer in the box goes over the top. If they, you know, if they, uh, if they block down and my end is outside, then my backer can fit inside of that. So obviously, again, these are things that we're talking through um, and haven't ran yet. But, you know, my thought was, could I play with a four eye and a two eye as opposed to a three and a five? Now, what issues are you going to get into? Obviously, pass rush is a big issue. Short edge. The ball is going to be on the perimeter. It's going to be out there because you're playing with a two eye and a four eye, not a three and a five. Traditional football would tell you. Everybody in an overfront is going to play a three and a five or a three and a seven or whatever it may be. But if you want to play three high stuff, similar to the way the odd teams do it, then what you have to do is you have to take the A and the B gap away. So that was one thought. My next thought would be having the three and five have two different games that the three and five can run on every snap. One would be the pirate stunt where the three and the five line up. And, and they both go under one gap. So the three crosses the guard's face and the five crosses the tackle's face. Um, and then, um, 
you'd have to loop the nose for contain in the passing game. Um, and then the other one was the twist stunt, where the three techniques, kind of a me-you game, you-me game, three technique penetrates first, and the end comes and long sticks into the A gap. Those two stunts will take away the A and the B gap, which is what you're going to need to do if you're going to play with a five-man box. Remember, one of your inside backers, if you're a 4-2-5 team, one of your inside backers is going to be apexed out almost all the time, even if you're playing 21 personnel. All right, so you're really – Personnel-wise, you're really only going to play with probably one inside backer, and the other backer is almost always going to be a guy that's apexed. If you play two-by-two two open, 10 personnel, both your inside backers are going to be apexed, and you're going to play with a 4-0 box. Now, crazy, I know, sounds crazy, but if you watch Iowa State play and they play two-by-two, two, you'll see a 3-1 box. You'll see a nose, four eyes, and a mic backer, and then the other backers are apexed out. Because those backers have to be apexed out so that your safeties can stay high to play all your versions of split field coverages. So that third safety being in the middle, um, when you go to three high safety coverages, he's not on one side or the other playing the high part. So he's now in the middle. So the two safeties on the outside have to play the palms, the quarters. They have to play the high part, which means your backers – have to apex out to be the guy that is swing deep at three. Or if you're a quarters team playing 21 personnel, you need somebody that acts as a Sam linebacker, carrying the wheel, doing all those things. So it's different. Um, but I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it a lot because um, I don't know if I'm sold on, on playing it the way Iowa State does with the three down guys. I think they have to be three dudes, and I don't know if I have those guys. Um, I think your inside linebackers and that defense have to be when you're playing it as an odd tight front, I think your inside backers, you need two war daddies that got to get downhill and plug um, a bunch. Um, even though they're semi-protected with four eyes and a B gap, I still think those need to be two physical inside linebackers. So I'm thinking about going to a four down front. So let me catch up on some of these. Um, at what point do you say to yourself, we need to change our scheme as opposed to let's just get better. Uh, Matt Stafford, uh, congrats on going to LA on your new gig. Um, that is a question. We've talked about that on videos a million times on YouTube live a million times. When do you take your talent and understand that your talent is good enough to win? You're just not executing well enough. Your scheme isn't getting it done. And when do you, you know, look at your talent and figure out that your talent, no matter how good you execute your talent in that scheme is never going to win. That's the toughest thing. The toughest thing to look at is, you know, is what we're doing right for us. Can it win in our conference, in our district, with the people we play? Do we need to do it better? Do we need to coach it better? Or do we need to get into something different? That, Matt, I wish I could answer you that question. But I, uh, philosophically, I cannot tell you how to answer that question. That's a gut feel. That's something that you got to go through with your coaching staff and your players and figure out what's going to put you in the best position to win. And that, to me, is a million-dollar question all the time. Uh, when is it scheme? When is it techniques, fundamentals? When do you get out of something and into something else? Uh, great question, Matt. Inside Veer scares everybody, David. You're not alone. We see so much wing T. We will go in a game. Uh, two, two eyes in our four, three with a cover two shield. Yeah, um, I, I see almost no wing T, Paul, as crazy as that sounds. So we really don't have to deal with that. But two eyes are not bad against the wing T. You know, get those guys in, in the hip pockets of the guard. See if you can either hump the center when the center blocks back or see if you can get skinny with the guards, um, take away the, the down block angle from the tackle. If they're going to try and pull the guards on buck, don't give them that three technique to down block. So I think two twos is, uh, or two eyes is a great idea. Another great idea is playing them head up in twos and moving them, uh, pinching them inside or moving them left and right to create an over front. Uh, I think is a good idea as well. Sometimes high school playing four down is better because there's a ton of great nose guards and there's not a ton of great nose guards. Yeah, it's all personnel dependent, Ross. I agree with you. But on the flip side of four down in high school, uh, not having the college NFL nose guards that you're thinking of, I agree with you 100%, Ross. But on the flip side, here's something to think about. Centers in high school are usually pretty bad, uh, especially shotgun centers, because a lot of times on their team, they're the only kid possibly that can consistently snap the ball. Um I know from experience I played with 160 and 170 pound centers because our bigger kids just couldn't snap the ball. And we played with a smaller center. And by the end of the year, everybody went odd and put a dude on the center and just wore his ass 
out. So that is why I think about going odd um, all the time in high school, especially. And the thing about odd, uh, I didn't think I was going to do it, but this conversation is going so good. I'm getting jacked up. I'm going to have to put a little red man in. Um, the uh, That's what makes odd stuff tough, but I think it makes odd stuff so great in high school. The center is just, you know, usually it's tough finding good centers in high school. When you got one, you've got it made. Um, you know, obviously – Finding six foot five tackles that can pass set and and finding six foot three, three hundred pound guards that can pull. Obviously in high school we play the cards we're dealt. It's tough. We're not recruiting. We we don't have grown men. But I'm telling you, um, do yourself a favor and more often than not, go back and study the last four, five, six years of teams you've played and look at the center and tell me how good of a player. Um Uh, shut down. I don't know if I do. Um, I think I do, bud. I, I, I think I did either a, a webinar on pressure or I did, um, I don't know if I did a webinar on pressure or if I did a, a, a hot video and showed clips of us running it. Um, I think I do. And it, it's Ryan, right? Correct. Shut down. If I remember from Twitter, first name's Ryan, I hope. Uh, yeah, I, 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 hell, I don't know, Ryan. I'd have to look on, on Patreon. I'd have to look and see. I know I've done some whiteboard stuff on YouTube. Um, love the stuff you do with the, uh, with the motivational stuff for the day too. That stuff is awesome. Um, I know I've done, I know I've done YouTube videos with, with generic hot stuff and, and, you know, six man, what he's, he's talking about six man pressure playing two under three deep with guys that are vision and break hot players, uh, I was shocked this year with everything that's out there on uh, everything that's out there on. For those of you that know what I do, obviously you're here um, and, and God bless you for being here. But I think you guys understand that you'll never see me put PDFs on Twitter. You'll never see me put uh, a college play on Twitter and analyze a college play. Mocha seven fire and, and Saban calls it this and, and Venables calls it that. That's not my niche. It's not my gig. A lot of great guys out there that do it, um, and uh, and I love what they do because I look at it. Don't get me wrong; it's just not for me to do. Um, but I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of clips of NFL teams running six man hot pressures, and I could not believe it until I saw it. And I saw somebody I think Blitzology on Twitter. Um, I think I think Blitzology uh, put something up there one time of, of somebody running hots and I could not, I did not think six man hots was an NFL thing, but it was, and it was awesome. And, uh, I did not order Starbucks, David. I do not drink coffee. I put in a, uh, I put in a red man, golden blend and a piece of gum. Um, Oh, so it is on there. Carmine. Thank you. Six man. I, I thought it was, I thought I did a video on there with us, uh, running our hots and our blitz tracks and then showing some of the coverage deals in it. Um, it's hard for me to remember sometimes all the, I've done over 400 and something YouTube videos and then all the Patreon stuff. Um, it's hard for me to remember sometime what, what exactly we've done and haven't done, but I thought I did. Um, yeah, we usually, we usually lean on smart centers, David. Uh, if um, I cannot, I don't know if I can agree with you. I've done Lancaster before, and I'm I'm not a Lancaster stays fresh a pretty long time. But I kind of I kind of go through chews every five or six minutes. I spit one out and put in another one. So, um, all right. Uh, I haven't done this in so long. I'm off kilter. Uh, going back to David's comment, we've always gone with the smarter center, David. We haven't had the luxury to have the big physical guy that can do it all. So we've always gone smaller and smarter. Do you prefer the two high Alabama cover seven? Do you prefer the three? I am not a rip Liz match guy, Nick. Um, I, I, I've dabbled in rip Liz match at times before I am a hundred percent too high safety quarter, quarter, half by the book. Um, similar to TCU and the way we teach it completely different than TCU in our terminology. Uh, but I am a, if, 
I am a cover seven guy, if that's what, what you're asking me. I am a quarter, quarter, half, quarters, toolbox guy. Yeah, vision and break's been pretty good to us too when we do it right. You got to have the right kids. You got to rep it. You got to drill it. They got to be patient. They got to understand. Um, done it both, Pete. Uh, when we struggle with traditional, we've gone to flip. Uh, I still like traditional myself. I'm not, I'm not, if I had to start one way or the other, I start traditional and then we go to flip if a kid can't do it, but I've done it both. Um, the thing I've had to do, Ryan, with, with a lot of our, uh, a lot of our hot stuff is, uh, depending on the talent I have and the kids I have, I try to get all our tracks to eliminate C gap to C gap. Uh, originally when I first started putting in hot pressures, I had some different ones that left interior gaps open and we did a really poor job fitting those. Uh, so a lot of our hot stuff became, uh, finding tracks and finding different ways to, um, eliminate C gap to C gap. Um, and, and try and get those hot guys to understand that they're extra fit where needed. The ball should come to you if we do it right. Um, but uh, that's just something that I've gone to. It, it, it's worked very well for us. Channeling Chargers criticism of Unitas with Stafford. <laughs> I think I've watched at least half of those YouTube videos. Well, that, that's good. Watch the other half. I'm, I'm getting uh, – watch the other half from Paul. I'm, I'm approaching $3 million, um, and – I don't know if, if YouTube gives you anything for 3 million views, but I'm approaching 3 million views on YouTube just past 21,000 subscribers. So if you've watched half the videos, watch the other half. And some are probably good. Some are probably shitty, but you might learn something here or there. Uh, you've seen the timing on screens like the X dragging across and wide receivers blocking in front of them. They allow them to block downfield, even though the wide receiver is not. No, that's actually um, they allow that because they don't see it. Um, you know, those are meant to be. Shallow screens thrown behind uh, the line of scrimmage. That guy is running shallow cross, but at some point he's supposed to get uh, behind the line of scrimmage. That is the only way you can block for that guy. So that is not a timing thing. That is a referees not doing their job thing. Uh, you're starting to see it a bunch and things making a series. Yeah, it's all like the mesh screen stuff, the shallow screen stuff where, you know, guys that are running mesh and shallow um, – you know, it, it, it marries right into what they do within their route concept. So now they run the mesh or the shallow and they turn it into a screen. That guy should be behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, it doesn't look like jailbreak because more often than not, there's not as many linemen out in front of it. It's more wide outs picking and blocking backers uh, than it is a full-fledged screen. But it's a shallow screen, a mesh screen, however you want to look at it. And uh, it's meant to be behind the line of scrimmage. Referees just don't call it. Um, well, the toughest thing is getting kids to fight through blocks when they think, um, you know, uh, bastards is not a bad word, Coach Cal. Uh, I don't know why it asked me to hide that or show it, but I love bastard to me is not, um, growing up on Long Island, I think I was a bastard most of my life or at least called a bastard back when coaches could coaches could talk to you the, the way they wanted to talk to you and you had no problem with it. Um, I, I think you're seeing it more just because of the route packages and getting guys in space. And, you know, it, it's just offenses are creative. They're getting guys in space. It's all about getting guys in space. And, um, you know, however you do that nowadays, every year the offense comes up with something new and that's just one of the new things they do. I think it's great if you can do it. Um, I think it's great. If you are a mesh or a shallow team, I think it ties right into that, and I think it's awesome. And it, and it's different than a traditional screen because I think the linemen most of the time pass set and let the D-line rush because they're not trying to get the linemen out in front on a lot of those screens. They're just using wide outs or running backs. <laughs> hey, Pete, that's – that's uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm answering a – text from my best friend in New York that Pete knew. <laughs> uh, hopefully, Pete, I'll be up there in June playing in a member guest at North Hempstead with him. He's uh, he's down to a house member now because he had his knee replaced uh, in December. So um, hopefully he's ready to go and we're ready to go. Um, thank you, Big Low. I, I, I appreciate you following and watching. Thank you so much. Um, 
But again, getting back and guys, just in case you don't know, or if you're new or, or any question you have, talk about whatever you want. When I, when I set YouTube live, uh, it, it, you have to put a topic on there. So I always have to put a topic. I can't just put, uh, you know, YouTube live or going YouTube live. I probably could, but it always asks you to put a topic. So, uh, whatever I'm thinking about that day or whatever I'm, whatever I'm thinking about talking about, I, 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 uh, I put that as the topic. So you guys can ask any questions you want. I'll talk about anything you want. If I can answer it, if I can't, I'll give you somebody on Twitter, maybe that can. Um, but, uh, but going back to, you know, having a four down package where we, where we play the three high coverages like Iowa state and then trying to figure out what kind of odd package, um, what kind of odd package I can play with it because I think you have to protect one or the other. If I was going to be uh, more of the Iowa State uh, odd front, um, if I was going to be more of the Iowa State odd front stuff and and play, you know, a combination of, of the tight front and the combination of, of 505 or 504 and mix and match those fronts like Iowa State, I think I would still have some type of even package. What I want to figure out is – do I need to change the coverage structure? Should my, if I play four down with three high safeties, should my odd package become more of a two deep, three deep, uh, traditional, maybe, um, maybe spot drop coverage, not pattern match. So we can spend all our time pattern matching the three high. So I'm, I'm kind of up in the air with that right now. Um, so I'm pivoting hand off to those like moon weak sign, the button hook. Yeah, probably, a, you know, some type of pivot handoff would be nice. Uh, do you prep for model? Always, Carmine, if you've seen it, uh, you you prep for anything that you've seen. I try not to prep for ghosts. I try not to prep for things. Um, I, I try not to prep for things that, uh, that I haven't seen that I think they might be able to do. But if I've seen garbage formations, if I've seen quads, or if I've seen unbalanced stuff, you have to prep. You know, if you've seen it, you have to prep for it. If you don't, uh, then you do your kids a disservice. I have been beat. Um, I have been beat in the past uh, where I didn't spend enough time with either unbalanced or some formations, and and uh, all you can do is apologize to the kids because it was my fault. So um, uh, trips tight and open bunches. Um, usually, you get into some kind of zone off variations like box concepts where. You know, it's four on three. Somebody has first out. Somebody has first in. Somebody has first up and out. Somebody has first up and in. Um, normally, when you see those, you got to make sure you set an edge. Um, no, that's just a Diet Coke bottle, Chris. I still drink Coke. Um, and I wish I knew what James Hetfield would say because I've never got a chance to meet James Hetfield. But that is uh, a bucket list for me, meeting uh, the one and only James Hetfield is a bucket list item for me. Um, three high with even. How do you handle bubble game? Don't. Yeah, we we would still have an apex player, Coach Cal. So um, our coverages would all be the same. Uh, we would still have an apex player. What I'm saying is, with four down, the apex player will probably be one of the inside backers. So I'm either in a four-one front or a four-zero front, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so the apex guy would be in our two read or our palms, the apex, the apex guy would be the swing deep of three. If three's the bubble guy, he's the guy that can't get out leveraged by three. Um, so we would still be able to handle three bubble. Uh, if it's two by two and it's back out, we'd still be able to handle those things the way we would in our, in our, uh, it's our normal defensive package for us. It's our normal split field coverages. Um, so The, the great thing about it is it's only that third safety becoming – he's really becoming a Mike linebacker in, in a way. That's the only thing that's changing. The rest of our coverages will stay the same. I got <coughs> – excuse me, guys. Allergies, pollen has been <coughs> – pollen down here has been terrible. I've got allergies. My nose is itching, driving me crazy. Um, so – we wouldn't have, I, I, you know, other than talent or not playing it right, we wouldn't have schematical issues with bubble. We wouldn't have schematical issues with the back out in the passing game. It would just be, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we well, see, Coach Cal. Here's the deal, and and I know, uh, I, I know this is hard, and and I know I've talked about this in the past, and I and I want to do it. Like, 
this this wall that you see behind me, my my original goal, I moved into this house about a year and a half ago, and my original goal, this is my man room, I wanted to put either a big whiteboard on that wall or I wanted to just paint that wall or do something where I could draw on it and write on it so that when I do uh, – Oh, COVID. I've got COVID-21. Um, when I do videos like this, I could possibly write things down uh, <coughs> so people don't get confused. I'm sorry, guys. Um, because e when, when I say 425, I'm not going to play a 4-2 box if I'm playing three high structures. Um <laughs> God, it's embarrassing. Sorry. When I say four two five, I I'm really going to be playing a four zero or a four one. I will almost never have a four two box if I'm playing three high structures because the come on no um, the the way to look at it the way to look at it is the uh, coach Cal that the the third safety is a quasi linebacker he. He ends up in the run fit like a linebacker. He plays coverages like a linebacker. So you're just doing it with him from six to eight yards deep so that the offense can't figure out who to block or where he's coming from. Um, so like I said, if I had – I knew Carmine would like that idea. If, if I could draw it up for you, I would. But, um, you know, if, if you just took your gen – in general, if you just took a two-by-two two set that was open, so two receivers wide – two receivers wide, one back in the backfield, no tight end, 10 personnel. I would play with a 4-0 four, a four box, which means I would have no linebackers in between the tackles. Both my linebackers would be walked out as apex players. The third high safety would be aligned off the back, but he would probably be anywhere from six to eight yards deep, kind of uh, third, excuse me, third level. Um, so to speak, third level, even though he's playing more like a second level player. And that's why with the four down, I've got to take away those interior gaps. I cannot line up in a four zero box with an open A gap on one side and an open B gap on the other side. I can't do it. It's impossible. So what I need to do is I need to either play with a four eye and a two eye instead of a three and a five, or I need to stunt those guys to take those gaps away. And then to the open B gap side, I think the thing to do is to play the five technique as a two gap player and allow him to cross face any blocks that come out at him. And now I've got all the interior gaps taken away and the ball should funnel out to the apex guys and then back into the third safety. If that makes sense. All right. Uh, let me go back. Three high became our answer to them trying to force where we set our nickel and our three stack. Yes, that's a good answer. Agree. I think the middle safety is like lining up in Tampa too. Uh, the stuff that we did this year, uh, Spellman, was only Tampa two. That's the only way we played it. And I now, uh, I want to get into playing more variations of the coverage. I want to get into, um, I want to get into playing, uh, my split field deals with that third guy in the middle acting like a Mike linebacker. I want to play some cover two deals. I want to play some cover three deals, uh, which is what Iowa state does. They have, you know, they'll take, They'll start off in three high, and two of the safeties will come down, and they'll play three deep. They'll start off in three high. The corners will come down, and they'll play. Uh, they'll drop eight and play three deep with the three safeties, and then it becomes like Tampa two. So uh, Tampa two this year was the only way uh, I played that coverage. But I'm I want to get into it as a base down is what I'm base coverage with all my split field deals is what I'm saying. Yeah, Connor, that would be great, but. Uh, we've had conversations on Twitter before. I, I don't think, um, I don't think I'd be able to handle a tablet and YouTube live and everything else. I'm just, I'm ADHD. I'm not technologically very good. Um, I'd be way better if I could just turn around, wear a hat so you don't see how bald the top of my head is. Turn around in my chair right here, right on a board right there. Turn back around. You see it right there. That wall behind me is perfect. I, I wish I could just uh, right all over that wall and then erase it somehow. I, I'm going to, I might figure out how to do that. Um, what, uh, uh, coach still thinking of going for four to five to three, three, five, as we spoke sometime in other lives, still not sure if I go to base five, zero five and spill everything. Um, that's what we did. Caroga. Uh, we were five, zero five. We spilled everything. Um, 
And then we played some tight front. We didn't make a living out of tight front uh, because we were a 3-3 stack team. When you see the tight front, and I did a video on this about two or three months ago called What is the Broken Stack? When you watch Iowa State play, they are a broken stack team. They will look um, to the naked eye. They will look more like a 3-4 team than a 3-3 team because they are constantly in 3-2 boxes where 3-3 stack teams rarely get out of that stack look. Nowadays, you have to. Um, but the idea with the 3-3 stack was to stay in that stack look, and then you were either a one-high team. I did it with split field coverage. We figured out how to do it, but we tried to keep that 3-3 stack look as often as we possibly could. Um, when you watch Iowa State play, you you would really – you would really think they were a 3-4 team because more often than not, they, they are in a dead 3-2 box. Looks like odd all the way. Look, I'm sorry, like looks like odd 3-4 all the way, but they're 3-3-5 three, three, personnel. They just break the stack and get into more 3-2 looks. So, But I, I Kuroga, to answer your question, um, uh, five zero five is how we started. We spilled the hell out of everything. We played some really good defense with it. Uh, one of the reasons was because I had a defensive end that's playing a freshman at Liberty right now. Uh, he was about six foot, 270 pounds, great football player. Um, so uh, when we couldn't spill and, and our ends weren't very good, we struggled with it. But when we could spill, we did really good. So uh, you got to remember when you get into the 3-3, three, three, everybody thinks you're going to move. So when you're a 3-3 three, three stack team, one of the beauties of it is everybody thinks you're going to move all the time. Everybody's anticipating slanting and angling. When you get into the 3-3 three, three and you just fit runs from a base 3-3 three, three structure and you don't move, it freaks people out. You, you've already got – your movements are already built into what you're doing. That's what makes the 3-3 three, three so great. But when I originally went to the 3-3 three, three, – one of the things I was dead set on was I was not going to become a 3-3 team that slanted and angled every down. I hated that. Um, I think you move into as many plays as you move out of. Uh, I thought it was always hit or miss, slanting to the field, the boundary. Um, slanting to the field, slanting to the boundary, doing a bunch of different things all the time to the back. So I was dead set on becoming a 3-3 team that fit runs like a 4-2-5 box, and that's and that's – it's basically what we did, and the reason we did it is because six in the box is six in the box. It, a 4-2 fit and a 3-2 fit are two different animals, but a 4-2 fit and a 3-3 fit are very similar animals because you got the same players. you got six in the box. You don't really have to change all that much. What would you say, say which part again, Gak? If I were you, Ryan, to be honest with you, I'd play country cover three. Um, I wouldn't try and teach Rip Liz match. I would play country cover three. I would spot drop and I would make them beat you. Um, that's what I would do. If, if if you're basing out of a out of a quarters package or out of a split field package, and then you're going to go to some type of three deep, I would go to country cover three. I would not go to Rip Liz match. I think Rip Liz match is something that you teach and you play and you make a living in it, um, and then you make your adjustments. But uh, not only not only for Verts Ross, but when the game gets live and there's pressure on the quarterback and all, I don't think they make as many of those throws as they do in seven on seven. So I would just I, I would go to I would go to spot drop country cover three. Then one of the best things we did out of it out of our three three deal was. It became, you know, it became Tampa two to us, but we left the corner in the flat and played the three safeties high. And now we could handle flood a little bit better and some things that were beating our country cover three. You know, we were taking speed off the receivers. We were disrupting timing. But then the, the you know, the the uh, the corner in the flat was a little bit harder to determine than just your standard curl flat player. So, you know, we started four under three deep and then eventually we cried kind of gravitated to um, five under three deep in a way. I think with the three, three, we make it easier for the, yeah, well, it, what we do with the will is if he can't, if he feels like he can't play the B gap, he just tells the end to take the B gap away. Um, you know, to that side, you're going to have an open B gap. If you're playing two read and they're in two by two, that's the side that's going to get RPO'd. So we just tell that guy when he walks out, either put that guy in a four eye or tell him to move 
post snap into the B gap, and that's how we handle it. Yeah, that's fine. You're you're fine there, Kuroga. You you apex him out, walk him out, leave the B gap open. If he can't play the B gap or he's out too far into the boundary, he'll never have a problem. Middle of the field, if he's out too far, then just give a call to the end to take away the B gap. Yeah, it, I just think because I grew up a quarters guy and I was taught how to play uh, quarters defense and then obviously the evolution of two read out of quarters, I just think Rip Liz became another pattern match deal that I, I just, you know, I I like learning it. I like studying it, but it just became another deal that was different and I didn't feel like we could teach all those pattern matches, so I just stayed away from it. Which part, the 3D part or the YouTube part, Ryan? Anything you think you can do, you can do. Just be ready for people to tell you that you're either crazy, stupid, dumb. I've heard it all. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a great story. Like 10 years ago or eight years ago when, we, when, when I told people what I was going to do with my safeties and I told people that we weren't going to play with a strike and a whip, and we weren't going to play with a with a strong uh, strong safety. We were going to play two safeties that stayed on their side, and we were going to teach them to play up and back. And all the all the people that I trust, uh, when I go to for information, all the people that I trust said you can't do that. You need a strong side guy. You need a field side guy. Play field and boundary. Play strong safety, weak safety. But you got to do that. You cannot do that. And we went ahead and did it anyways. Um, I was dead set on doing it uh, for a couple of reasons. And we went ahead and did it anyways. And about four or five years later, all of a sudden, all this positionless hybrid defense talk comes out. And all these guys are talking about how they're finding, you know, like when Jay Bateman was at Army before he went to North Carolina. And, you know, when they almost beat Oklahoma, he became one of the biggest names out there. Um and they started talking about finding these guys that could do multiple things, guys that could be a safety but can be down and be a linebacker, and they can blitz, and they can cover, and it's positionless defense, and it's hybrid players. Sometimes if you have an idea, you just got to do it and, you know, do it to the best of your ability. Uh, you owe it to yourself to see if it could work. Um, if you look at everything that's ever happened in football – the first time somebody did it or thought about it, everybody else probably said, hell no, you can't do that. The first time somebody started about RPO, no, you can't do that. First thing somebody thought about leaving an end unblocked and, and meshing the ball with a fullback, no, you can't do that. The first time they left the three technique unblocked to run midline, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, if you think about it, everything that's ever happened, uh, you know, zone blitzes, which originally started as – Zone blitzes were being run 50, 60, 70 years ago. Guys were just playing like Bud Wilkinson. Guys were playing 50 defense, and, and they were playing with defensive ends that rushed every down, and they voided the flat, or they voided a zone somewhere because nobody threw the ball. And then all of a sudden when teams started throwing the ball, this idea of zone pressures and how to match, carry, deliver, and how to play zone pressures to cover passes all of a sudden became this new – craze, you know, buzz idea when guys were guys were rushing five from the 50 years ago. They were just vacating areas because nobody threw the ball. And then as teams evolved and started to throw the ball, they figured out if I'm going to send five, I got to figure out a way to cover these better. So match, carry, deliver, three under three deep, all that shit. Um, that's where it all came from. So do you like to go with pre-snap or post-snap movement with your DBs? You talking about uh, rolling them, Otis, or stemming them, or doing? I like to show different looks pre-snap, and then I like to move. I like to show different leverages. I like to show different depths. If I'm too high, I like to spin. Um, if we are to the single side, I like to show the same picture every time. If the corner is going to be the force player, I like him coming in and slicing late. If the safety's coming down, I like him coming down late. Anything that changes the picture for the OC. Because nowadays the OC looks at the picture and calls a play. So anything that changed, you used to, you used to try and confuse the quarterback in football, um, you know, because everything was audible and 
done at the line and guys had a run and a pass at the line and all that other stuff. And well, now the OC is the guy calling the plays more often than not. So you got to confuse him and not really worry as much about confusing the quarterback. So anything you can do that way, spin, roll, adjust them. Uh, the more you can do, the better. Uh, but at the end of the day, don't let uh, – don't let the stem, the movement, the roll, don't let that affect the technique or, or the execution of the play. If disguising something uh, ruins the execution of the play, then the disguise ain't worth a shit anyways. Uh, so make sure you got smart kids. Make sure they understand what they're doing, how to hide things. When you get to that point with your DBs that they know how to get to different places on the field uh, and play their assignment, then you're at a really good spot. Uh, if you can, I've had years where I don't, I, I never let our kids move. I didn't trust them. You better be lined up where you need to play that, that, you know, that assignment uh, because they couldn't play anything else. So we never moved. If you're in this long enough and you do it long enough, I've been doing it 22 years now. You see all kind of shit. Um, I've had teams where uh, I've had teams where, you know, we've been able to disguise and stem and move and do different things. I've had teams where we've only been able to play one coverage all year. So, um, you know, it, it depends on the kids. It depends on your coaching staff. It depends on what kind of off season you have. How many returning players do you have? There's a lot that goes into it. Um, yes, if you could, if you could move to replace a blitzer, that's always better because if you line up there, then they know that guy's coming. Uh, so anytime you can move later to replace a blitzer, um, I think that's always a better deal. Uh, especially depending on where you're blitzing from. That's the other thing I like about the three high safety stuff. Uh, I saw a lot of neat things in the Super Bowl. Uh, I believe it was Super Bowl uh, that the Patriots were doing. And, and um, you know, those three high safeties were coming down and replacing blitzers. They were dropping back to the half and the middle guy was coming down. It, there's a lot of interesting things you can do uh, with, with those three safeties. That's why I like it a, a, a bunch. 100% players, not plays. Always players, not plays. Think drive, post dig concept, and back running wheel on the same side. Overhang has to carry the wheel. And our two read quarters now drag into the area he vacated. You see this? Yes, you will see that. You have to have, you have, to have variations to your coverage. Uh, obviously, your Mike linebacker should be pushing to that window because he's the guy that has to relate to three also. So when three swings, um, your inside linebacker needs to push that way, uh, which is why – Read away from Mike or Ram theories are huge. Um, I absolutely love Ram theories on offense. I love going two by two. I love pushing my tail back out in motion before the snap. And if you're a split field safety team and your Mike has to match, then I love going backside with levels or some type of choice route to my slot or anything else I can do because I know that the Mike has pushed. We've thrown screens off a of Mike push. So um, the Mike will push and kind of get into that window. Um, but you also have some – got to have some other coverage deals. Uh, if you have Mike take back some outside linebacker, we'll be sitting on – yeah, there's other things you can do. We play one rat a bunch, which is man-to-man uh, -man underneath with a low-hole player and a high-hole player. So now we're going to cover those routes man, and then we're going to have a low-hole player. Hopefully that can get in front of that dig window. Um, you know, bottom line is if you stay in one coverage, there's going to be coverage beaters that are going to be tough – that one's going to be tough, but I think your Mike linebacker can help you on the dig because he's pushing when three pushes. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, if you're a rip list match team, then then your Mike is going to take three through. So now um, now your safety would, would play more of the, the drive or, or the post or whatever it is that two's running because he's vertical, and now your Mike would carry three through. So um, just a bunch of different ways to do it, but you always got to have a cover. Um, if you're going to run cover one, I suggest one rat. Um, unless you're going to send five, I, I suggest uh, I suggest one rat where you have a low hole player and a high hole player. The low hole player can help you on mesh and shallow and, and those throws, and then he can help you on screens and draws. Um, so we've played it for a long time. We It's usually one of the base deals we teach. Um, it's probably one of the second or third things we teach after our original pattern match. We teach what – I call robber coverage. That's how I learned it um, way back in the day from Nebraska back in the early 90s. Um, I know it's not what everybody else thinks of of robber, but um, 
but we call it robber. That's how our kids know it. So, uh, mesh is usually going to be handled with passing off, uh, you know, passing, trying to cut those routes from getting across your face. But if they get across and you're making an under call, you're trying to pass it off to the, um, you're, you know, they're trying to, you're trying to pass it off to basically if you're playing two read, your two apex guys, your overhangs, that the, the issue that you have is to the side they send the back, if that overhang gets out and the mesh from the backside gets across, now you're going to end up with a little bit of an issue. So, um, Sorry, David, I don't know if I can show that or not. Pretty funny, though. Um, yeah, uh, who, Coach Cal, what are you asking? Or, yeah, like cover one mesh is going to be a pain in the ass because it's a man concept, right? So anytime you get a man concept, you're going to get rubs. You're going to get picks. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get some different deals. So when you play it, when you play it with one rat, you can always have somebody that's there to help with the picks. He's helped with, he's there to help with the rubs. If you can, um, if you can, uh, if you can if you can teach your guys how to trade some of that off to say, all right, I got number two, two goes in, you pass them off to, to the inside backer, and I take three coming out, um, you know, any of those banjo deals are better. But eventually the, the mesh coming from opposite sides, eventually man-to-man -man players are going to get picked, they're going to get rubbed. So that's why guys are coming up with different ways, you know, playing cone-type coverages where the safety, you know, the corner has the outside routes and, and the safety has – some type of bracket deal where somebody inside can cut that uh, to avoid chasing it man to man. But at some point, if you're playing man to man, you're going to get um, those types of deals. And that's why offensively, uh, you know, I carry so many or I try to carry so many RPOs because a lot of times in RPO football, you're going to get man defense because if people can't handle your RPO deals, in their zone coverages, they're going to go to man. When you dictate that they go to man, now you know that you can run your man beaters. So, um, but again, like everything else, guys, it, it's you got to have change ups. You got to have something else. Uh, you know, if you're in if you're in two read, they're going to have concepts to beat it. Uh, so you got to be able to have something else. If you're in man, they're going to have concepts to beat it. You got to have something else. Uh, unless you're absolutely loaded with a bunch of D one kids, it's very hard to live in one thing all night long and defend everything. There is no magic bullet on defense. There is no one thing that defends everything. Um, and offensive guys are so good now. They're they're finding ways to beat what your base is. They're finding ways to beat what your deal is. So you've got to have other deals. That's the that's the bottom line. The, the biggest key in high school is how many deals can you have. Um, and 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 even for me, uh, coaching for twenty two years, you know, like when we go into the spring. I always struggle with, okay, what are our two main deals or what are I, you know, I get carried away like everybody else. I get carried away trying to, trying to, um, I don't know what that is, but I don't know what that is, Coach Cal, but it didn't seem offensive to me. So, um, so, uh, you know, I, I struggle like everybody else in the spring. What are our two main deals? Yeah, for some reason it wanted me to hide that like it was some type of uh like it was some type of um you know offensive deal. Yeah, and and you know the toolbox is the best answer. You have your toolbox, you've got your necessities and then you got your answers in a toolbox. Um you know, but you just got to remember it, it that's what makes to me that's why I love coaching football. That's the Xs and Os, that's the chess game. You know, that's the chess match with you and that other coach getting in and out of things, tendencies. Um, can you do different things out of different things? Or are you stuck doing one or two things in one look? That's why I'm thinking about if we play three high out of our four down, then maybe when I go out, I play three deep or two deep or something else so that I have some change up, some different stuff uh, that I do. So we're not always three high. Um, or I need to be more diverse when we are four down. I need to be able to carry a bunch of other coverages when we are four down. And then when we go odd, maybe it's a movement or a blitz package. So those are the things I think about them like everybody else. I get confused like everybody else. Um, I probably try to carry too much like everybody else. Um, and I think that's what makes the great coaches great. They, they know they know their deal. They know their base. They do it well. They teach it well. And they don't get 
uh, that far away from um, from what they're doing. I also want the simple fly to blitz, basic bullets, dogs. and Yeah, I mean, you could do it that way. Uh, I think Gary Patterson has done it that way for a long time. Um, you know, you get your get your inside backer blitzes and then get a backer on a safety blitz and then double safety or safety and corner blitzes. I think that's an easy way to do it. Hey, Rock, I wanted to ask you a question, but the, uh, it was – I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but do you coach at that school that James Light coaches at or in that area? When you were telling me about your game in Michigan and, and, and what you guys were doing, he was posting some similar things on Twitter, and I thought it was uh, – either a coincidence or, or, or really ironic when I saw him posting some of the things and then you were telling me and texting me about some of the things that were going on uh, in your game or in your playoffs or in your state championship game in Michigan. So I, I meant I had been meaning to ask you that for a little while. What does the backspace button do, David? I have no idea. Educate me. Maybe just play zero or two over four and two over three. Yeah, we try to um, – when we pressure Kuroga, we try to play – we try to play man free. We try to play three under three, and we try to play uh, two under four or uh, two over four. I'm sorry. So when we send five, we're trying to give you uh, – we're trying to give you all three looks. So when we send five, we try to send five and play man free, try to send five and play three under three deep, and we try to send five and play four under two deep. Oh, I didn't know that. So he he's your head coach, Rock? He posts a bunch of really good shit on Twitter all the time. I like following I like following his stuff. He does a really good job. I knew I knew when you were texting me the stuff that was going on in the uh yeah, I knew when you were texting me the stuff that was going on in your game, and then I saw things he was posting on Twitter. It just seemed a little bit too coincidental for me, and I, I meant I've been meaning to ask you that. I'm glad you jumped on. Um, that's pretty cool. He's a good dude. Uh, everything I read, uh, really smart guy. Um, Jack's a Michigan guy too. Michigan kid. I think Jack's an 11th grade kid. I can show that, Kyle. He's probably, you know, Coach Cal, he's probably making money like everybody else now trying to do it, you know, the way I, I have a Patreon site that's like $5 a month that I think is uh, – I, I don't update it as much as I should, but uh, for $5 a month I think it's pretty cheap and I'll give more game film and some other stuff out on that. I'll give clinic information out on that because people pay, but – you know, he's probably a guy that, you know, he's a smart guy that understands what he's doing. He's got a lot of good stuff. Uh, he's one of those guys that analyzes a lot of college and NFL stuff. That's his niche. That's what he does. Uh, and after a while, you get a big enough following and people want the information. And then you find out if they'll pay for it. And then when you find out that they will, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a business world. You know, everybody that coaches doesn't make a lot of money. And we're all trying to – if you got a family and you got kids uh, – it's um, you know, it's uh, it's just a deal where you're trying to leverage. If you've got a market that that you do good in, um, you know, if you if you do a market that or have a market, my my thing for me, the toughest thing for me is is I made my bones on YouTube. Uh, you know, I I don't like chasing jobs. I don't like chasing talent. I like finding jobs and staying there and building them. And so I've lost a lot of football games in my career and. You know, I've been three rounds deep, but I've never been to a state title game. Don't know if I'm ever going to win a state title. So uh, YouTube is how I cut my teeth. It's how I got my following. It's how I got my fans. So I made sure I was never going to do something that was subscription only. Um, and then I tried to keep my niche. The biggest thing in this, I, I tell anybody all the time, I've talked to Shutdown Defense about it. When you want to do something, whether it's on YouTube or Twitter or whatever it is you want to do, Find your niche, something that you can do and stick with it. Uh, you know, try not to be like everybody else. So like I said, I used to get comments all the time about playbooks. I never wanted to be a playbook guy. I never wanted to be a PDF guy. I never wanted to be, uh, 
although I watch the stuff and, and I enjoy it, um, I never wanted to be that guy that puts up all Saban stuff um, and tells you how Saban does it. Cause we don't have Saban's kids. We don't have Saban staff. We don't have, you know, um, we don't have all those things. We're a high school. We've got what we got. So, you know, I wanted my stuff to be more pertinent to high school people and, and, um, and middle school people and, and, and whatnot. So, uh, I just found out when I first started doing this, I just found out whatever your niche is, find your niche, find what you do well and kind of stick with it. And, um, it would have been easier to go that route if I would have, uh, if I would have been interested enough to figure out all 22 and then how to do all that stuff and make copies. I mean, it would have been, e it would have been to me, it would have been easier to put, uh, put film up there and say, all right, here's them running this, here's them running that. But, uh, it's just, not something I do, not something I like doing. The guys that do it do a great job. Um, and I read it. I look at it on Twitter. I look at it on YouTube. I follow it all the time. Uh, you know, but it's just not something that's for me. So when you, you know, when, when you're going to start something, <clears throat> whether it be books, you know, whether it be books or playbooks or anything else, um, you know, when you're going to start something like that, just figure out what you do and, and be true to you in the best way that you know how to do it. And, Worst thing you can do is try to do shit that you don't know how to do, and then you end up looking like a jackass. So, yeah, the whiteboard's easiest for me, Jake. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not good with a computer. I'm not good. I use Just Play. Just Play is awesome. It's easy for me to use. Um, I don't like sitting in front of a computer. I don't like typing. I don't like. I don't like any of that shit. I just like a marker. I like being able to erase when I make a mistake. I like being a, I grew up on Glazier clinics when I cut my teeth. I grew up, um, you know, watching people put stuff on a board and, you know, you could be, you're trying to combine, you're trying to combine, uh, in a way you're trying to take everybody's, everybody's mode of learning. So you're trying to hit kinesthetic people. You know, it's tough to hit kinesthetic people, uh, unless you can show video or because obviously on a, on a YouTube video, I can't run around, I can't move around, but you know, your visual people you're trying to hit your auditory people you're trying to hit. So you everybody's got a different way that they'll learn. So when I do mine on a whiteboard, I'm trying to hit visual people with drawings and then I'm trying to hit auditory learners with words and buzzwords and other things. And so, um, you know, it's just kind of a method of how you teach and how you're trying to teach and what you're trying to do. And, and then Patreon, I, I actually do, you know, I figured out how to do it on Zoom and how to use my video clips and then how to draw over my video clips with me talking over the stuff on Patreon. So, um, you know, that stuff works. It's good. It's just, uh, you know, it's just different. It's just different. You know, I tell everybody, people ask me all the time, people, you know, uh, other guys get into YouTube and then they ask you for, you know, they ask you if you'll subscribe to their channel or if you, they'll ask you if you can retweet something. And, you know, I, I've had people tell me before, well, you know, don't you worry about them? You know, aren't they going to saturate the market? Aren't they going to cut into your business? And no, I don't think so. I don't, you know, I don't think somebody else being on YouTube is going to cut into my business. I think there's football coaches are dying for information. They'll get it from wherever they can get it from. And the more of us out there doing it, um, the better it is. Uh, so, you know, anytime I see something on Twitter that says, Hey, trying to get the 500 subscribers, I'm always one of the first to get on and subscribe and, um, you know, anybody that sometimes you got to be careful because people just, if you've got a large audience, people try to get your audience. So, um, but I, I just never, you know, uh, just a football coach. I'm just a guy, you know, I'm not, I'm not Tiger Woods. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not. So when guys ask me to do a podcast, I do a podcast. If they're doing it because they, they think they'll get more followers, um, you know, they, they'll, they'll get more followers because my followers listen. So be it. Podcasts are cheap and easy. It doesn't, doesn't take, all it takes is time. It's not like I'm doing physical labor. So, you know, the biggest thing in the community, give back to people, you know, we're losing, um, winning and losing has become so important in football that we're, we're losing our fraternity. We're losing, we're losing our ability to, you know, to help people because we don't want, if I help him, maybe he'll use it to beat me. Or I've had people ask me all the time, you do all these videos and then don't you worry about the team you're playing, watching your videos and shit. They got all my games on film. What, what are they going to learn from a video? You know, so uh, we've gotten so far away from helping people 
and trying to make better coaches. And everybody's afraid if they make somebody a better coach, they're going to lose to that person. And, you know, it is what it is. If you do what you do better than I do, then shake hands. That, that's competition. That's life. Um, and when I started this business, it really was a fraternity. And 22 years later, it's it's become a cutthroat, shitty world. There's a lot of good people in it, thank God. But, um, you know, when you read some of the headlines of, uh, you know, you read a recent headline of a, of a guy in Georgia that's, you know, he's in trouble. He's, he's, he's paying rent for people and people are moving from three states and they're paying the rent for those families to live there and shit like that. I mean, those are the people that eventually are going to get the business screwed up because if you're doing stuff like that, you're trying to win. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to win at all costs. And we're supposed to be raising high school kids and teaching the game of football and making people better human beings. And, um, you know, I, I think it's very hard for me to try and teach a kid, you know, hell, I have a hard enough time chewing tobacco and feeling like, you know, I'm a bad influence on kids if they see me chewing tobacco, let alone going out and robbing, stealing and recruiting and lying and doing shit and then turn around and telling a kid that he can't be late to English class. You know, I mean, how can you tell a kid that he needs to be in class? How can you tell a kid he needs to be in school? How can you tell a kid he needs to get the workouts on time? But everything you do is flawed and twisted. And so there's my rant on that for the day. Yeah. When spring football starts shut down, you'll get, you'll get more clips obviously. And it's easier to, it's easier to show clips when I'll have more to put on Patreon. I've got one or two more Glacier clinics that I'm going to go through like I did the other day. Um, and, uh, and then when, when obviously when spring comes, if we're playing three high, I can, we can show some of that. We're playing a really good, really good private school in the spring. So we're going to get our ass handed to us, but um, it'll be good for our kids. Cause we got a young group that I really like that are working hard. And I think we can be, if we can find two or three more linemen, I think we can be pretty good in our area. So um, I saw a great thing. Uh, now that you mentioned that shutdown, I saw a great thing from Herm Edwards the other day about eliminating rules and just having standards. If you have rules in your program, kids always are, even adults or college guys, rules feel like when you have a rule and somebody breaks it, it feels like you're you're impinging upon their freedom. When you have a standard, now you're letting them know that you either live to the standard to play football or you don't. And now it it, it was just a really neat thing that he did. You don't have rules, you have standards because rules infringe upon freedoms and standards are what they are. You either live up to the standard to be, you know, an Arizona State football player or you don't. So that was one of the best things I had seen in a – in a long, long time, and I'm thinking about going to uh, using standards, not rules. Um, so, all right, guys, it's been about an hour and 37 minutes. I appreciate all of you being on. Hopefully, uh, some of the three high talk that I said I was going to talk about, hopefully we covered it. Hopefully, I kind of uh, gave you an idea of what you would need to do if you wanted to be three high with four down. Talked about a lot of great other things. Uh, you guys are awesome. Pete Porcelli, finally glad I put two and two together that you are that guy that Chris Cameron used to talk about. So thank you. Everybody else that's getting ready to play football, Carmine, everybody else, um, God bless you. It's possible we played 10 games. Um, people in Florida did it. Uh, you can do it. Do all the things they tell you to do, whether you like them or not. Keep the kids safe. It's possible. Uh, but the best thing is let's get out there and let's play ball. And uh, we'll do this again sometime in the near future. If you guys – uh, if you follow me on Twitter or on any of my YouTube videos, if you want something on a live, if you want a live uh, content, next time I do YouTube live, if you want a certain topic, just tell me. I'll do whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to cover certain topics on live, just tell me and uh, and I'll do it. And I'll think about next time bringing in a rolling whiteboard so we can actually get after some stuff uh, with a whiteboard. But uh, thank you, Carmine. Good luck to you. Good luck to everybody else. If you're playing, if you're getting ready for the spring, good luck to you. If you're running your off season, good luck to you. Stay safe. Take care of your families, as always, guys. You won't play well until you play fast. Love you guys. See you next time.